Good morning, everyone. Um, my talk, thankfully, won't cover anything about General Motors. Uh, it doesn't really count as a startup. Um, but what I will talk about is some of my time at Sonos and some of the issues we had to deal with and how we kept trying to find serenity in the startup. And so I'm sure many of you are familiar with the, the serenity song or serenity prayer and about talking to people about being able to accept things that they have to, change things that they can, and then really knowing which one is which. And I'm sure you're all familiar with the prayer, but not probably are familiar with Reinhold Niebuhr. Well, Reinhold, 90 years ago, is the gentleman that actually wrote this prayer. But Reinhold is actually better known as a 20th, mid-century, 20th century philosopher and thinker. And his thinking and philosophy has influenced people as diverse as Barack Obama and John McCain. That's pretty covering the spectrum. Really what Reinhold Niebuhr was, as well as a theologian, was talking about how to deal with the world around you. And he kind of railed against a utopian view of, of the other religious leaders at the time because they felt that their views on religion didn't translate to the real world. They didn't really help people on a day-to-day -day basis deal with what they had to face with. And so he spent a lot of his time and a lot of his teachings were about that. And, and that comes through in this psalm. It's really about pragmatism. He was known as a pragmatic Christian. And that is, you know what? You can have views of the world and how you want it to be and how it should be, and then there's how it is. And connecting those two and knowing how to deal with those two is really the key to that, and it applies to a startup. Because a startup, in its very essence, is kind of a utopian adventure. You have your plan, it's this perfect world that you've drawn up, and you take to investors or people to give you funding or <clears throat> to even make yourself believe. You know, it's belief that's common between religion and startups as well. And it's sometimes an unfounded belief. There's nothing really you can touch to make it proven. You just have to believe in it. Well, you have that plan, but then stuff happens. And it's your ability to deal with that that we're going to talk about today. But Reinhold wasn't the first person to really think and talk and express this view. An ancient Greek philosopher, Epictetus. Now, isn't there always an ancient Greek philosopher about everything? You can find an ancient Greek philosopher that will tell you anything. But he really talked about knowing what's in your power and being able to do stuff with that. And then the rest of it, you just got to take it, you know? You got to figure out what you can control and what you don't. Some things are up to us, a lot of things aren't up to us. And it's that same, same philosophy, if you will, the same belief system that Reinhold was expressing. But it took a really late 20th century massive philosopher, Mike Tyson, to really put a fine point on it when he said, Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> and as a startup, you are going to get punched in the face. And so I'm going to take a couple examples from my time at Sonos where we frankly got punched in the face and how we did it, did about it, what we did about it. Now, first off, in 2004 is when Sonos launched their first system, and this was the control. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Sonos, it makes multi-room music systems. The ability to play music in any room in your house, control it from one point, play the same song in every room or different songs in different rooms, it all have a control. It's a wireless, Wi-Fi connected home audio device. And one of the first of its times, I actually was at Sony Electronics and uh, was running the home audio and home video business and the TV business. And when Sonos came out, I bought one and sent it to our friends in Japan and said, we need to do this, this is the future. They chose not to. And about a year and a half later, I left and became the president of Sonos because this is how things are going to be done in the future. This is, if you will, some of the first, this was IoT before IoT existed. If you will, in our controller, we affectionately called it the Russian iPod. <laughs> um, it was about this big, and for, for list-based information, it was a great interface with the scroll wheel, and you can see list playing. But, you know, streaming services were coming online, you need to be able to do search, and so, we developed a touch screen interface in 2009 for another controller. And so five-year product cycle is pretty good for a startup, especially a hardware startup. 
And so we are working fast and furious on this thing that's going to be our next generation of controller. That's all good. In the middle of that development, this little guy came up. In, in September 2007, the iPhone was launched. Initially, we were like, cool, because this is going to make music available to a lot more people. It's going to bring a lot more people into the notion of streaming music, and they're going to have their music files on their iPhone, and they need to play it around their house. This is all good for us. And then the punch. They introduced the software development kit so you could build apps for it on March 6, 2008. And on March 7th, the CEO and I got together and said, oh, crap. <laughs> because we realized that if anybody can write an app for this, this is going to be people's interface to their world around them. And that app is going to be how they're going to interface with you. Now, mind you, 35% of our revenue was generated from our sales of controllers. 35%. But we said, you know what? We can't change this. We have to accept that this is going to happen. And as much as we don't want it to happen in terms of hurting our controller sales, we have to deal with that. And how we dealt with it is we took our best engineers. And once again, as a startup, you don't have a lot of capacity and ability. Come on in, guys. You don't have a lot of passing your ability, what you have are you know, some really great people and a small team. And we took our best engineers off of our hardware controller and put them on writing a mobile app. And in July 2008, when the App Store opened, we were one of the first 500 apps in the App Store. Now, we still completed the controller because we needed to transition, but we, we stopped any other future work. We did as little as we could to complete that controller because we still had some customer base that we needed to bring along in transition and put all of our effort into this iPads, Android phones when they came out. So we accepted that the world around us had changed overnight for us in the middle of something we were doing. And by doing so, we actually managed to grow our business. And now, I was mentioning this earlier to somebody else, 2008, 2009, remember what, what happened? The recession, and we're selling a high-end discretionary home audio device. We still grew our business 2009 over 2008 by 45 percent because we tapped into people's interests and in what was becoming central to their lives, and we provided them an opportunity to enjoy music in ways they couldn't before by leveraging that. So it's a clear example of where we got punched. We had to accept that then do what we could do to change and adapt for that. Now here's an example of the opposite, where something happened that we needed to act to change on. In 2008, um, we were going really pretty well in the United States because we had good relationships with the then Napster, um, Pandora, uh, Sirius XM, and all their streaming services. And we found, and we had the information and the data to support it, it says where there are music services available, streaming music services, we sell more music devices. So that's a good thing for us. And we were expanding in Europe, and in Europe there was a, one called Deezer. I don't know if people follow the uh, mid-20s, uh, 2000s music streaming services. A company called Deezer, they were in, Paris, in France and a couple other countries. We worked with them, all great. And then out of Sweden, there's a company called Spotify. And they were taking the world by storm from Northern European South, and then eventually they've come to the United States. But we're like, wow, we gotta, we gotta work with these guys because they're gonna help our business, and frankly, we're gonna help their business because if you can listen to music more places, we knew that their retention would go up. So we went to Spotify and we said, okay, we'd like to work with them. They said, great, here's our protocols. We're like, what do you mean, those are your protocols? All of the other music streaming services that we use, use standard internet protocols for streaming. Stream control, music control, flow control, things of that nature. And so we had developed all of our APIs around these standard interfaces. And so we thought we could quickly adopt music services from everywhere using those. And Spotify was like, yeah, no, we don't use those. Well, what the hell? We, we want to work this out. And so we're like, okay, 
They're not going to change. They, they, they're also were a startup at the time. They didn't have a lot of engineering resources. We said, tell you what, we will send some of our engineers to work for you to rewrite the interface so that you could then interface to not only us, but to anybody else that would be using these standard music interfaces. And they're like, you do that? We're like, yeah, we do that because we believe in this combination. We believe that together we're gonna to be much better. And yeah, you'll own the code. If you wanna support any other hardware device, go right ahead. We're gonna go there, we're gonna put engineering, engineers in Sweden to work with you to help you write this code. And we're like, okay. So we sent engineers over there, and in July of 2008, we launched an interface with Spotify. Now there is an instance where we changed what we could. Even though it was outside of our immediate company, we thought this was important enough for us to go and invest our precious resources in doing it. And it actually paid off for us very well. We, um, in Scandinavia, after we launched this, we were outselling Sony there's a very lot, large hi-fi retailer that covers most of Scandinavia. We've had more dollar revenue than Sony did in that hi-fi retailer after we launched this combination of Spotify. This shows you the power that that combination pulled through for us and made us grow in that way. So you have two examples, acceptance and change. Now the key question is, what's our wisdom checklist? How do we know, how did we know which was which? How did we figure out when we had to accept something and when we had to change something. Well, first and foremost, you gotta know who you are. You have to know what your mission is and be true to that mission. At Sonos, our mission was fill every home with music. That's it. As few words as you can get to say it, as succinct as you can say it, as bodacious as you can make it, Make that your mission statement. Fill every home with music. Now, how does that apply to here? Well, it wasn't fill every home with music controllers. So letting go of the controller was in line with our mission. And in the case of Spotify, their music that was important to the homes in Europe, and we had to figure out how to fill those homes with that music. Again, true to our mission. Secondly, know how you create value for your customers. <clears throat> Why do they value? Why do they give their hard-earned money to buy your product? Understand it really elementally what that is about and what they need from you to continue that. In the case of Sonos, what we did was we made music easy. That was really our value. We, had, we did a lot of surveys. People that listened to an hour of music before they owned Sonos listened to two hours of music when, after they purchased Sonos. Because we made it easy for them to get to their music. They didn't have to go over and put a CD into a thing or tune a channel or whatever. They walked in the house, pulled out a phone, hit a button, now music's playing throughout their home. We reduced the barriers to music. And so that was our value. And so once again, in both of those cases, you could see how we figured out how to adapt in one case and change in another case to keep adding value to our customer. Third thing, be realistic about what your, your capabilities are. And I love the word capabilities because in my mind, it's about capacity and ability. How much can you do? As a startup, we had 100 people when this was happening in the case of the um, iPhone. That's not a hell of a lot of capacity. Now, we had a lot of ability in software, but we didn't have a lot of capacity. We couldn't have afforded to do that controller and that app at the same time. We had to delay one for others. We had to make those trade-offs because we knew intimately what our capability and capacity were, and that's what we used to drive. In the case of Spotify, we knew we had the capacity to put two engineers over there because of what we're the current. Next, know your environment. Know what's important in your environment. Now, um, for example, Cisco, the router company, came out with a music device that we thought about interfacing with at about the same time as the iPhone, actually. And we're like, no, that's not an environmental condition for us. They're nowhere in our environments. 
people at home don't think about Cisco or anything like that, so we're not gonna deal with that. Apple, on the other hand, that is a huge part of our environment and who we were selling to and what our customers are. Once again, knowing our customer, that defines your environment. If stuff's in your environment, you gotta figure out how to deal with it. Stuff's outside of your environment, frankly, don't waste a second of time on it. Don't waste a second of time on it. And these are in a specific order. Is this kind of an inside to outside view? First inside is know your company's mission. And know what your customers have. Then know what you can do for those customers. And then know what the environment that you're working in looks like. So it's an inside out view because that's how you're gonna understand and prioritize things as you go through this. And finally, don't work on stopping the rain. Work on building an umbrella, right? Now, and sometimes you gotta say, well, it's just a drizzle, it's gonna pass. That was Cisco for us, that was a drizzle, it's gonna pass. And other times, wow, that's a freaking monsoon downpour. We better figure out how to stay dry. That was the iPhone and the SDK for us. And understanding those two and building those two together is really what this is all about. And if you really want to boil all of this down, it is to being pragmatic and having the information and having, and as a startup, you really can't build for contingencies. There's no way, you just, that's inefficient as all get out. Now, General Motors, when I worked at General Motors, we built for contingencies because it's you know, a $150 billion company. It had a little bit more in the resource category and the implications of not dealing with those uh, contingencies were far greater. As a startup, you can't afford to do that or else you'll fail on your core mission. So when something comes up, you're gonna have to react to it. You can't plan for it. You don't have enough time, you don't have enough energy, you don't have enough ability to plan for it ahead of time. Don't delude yourself. But what you can have is a firm grasp of who you are, what you're capable of, so when that contingency comes up, you can react very quickly to it, or know if you have to react to it. And so finally, rewriting Reinhold Niebuhr's printer for the startup. I would go bored. <laughs> Grant me the slack to accept the things we cannot change the capital to change the things we can, and the guidance to know the difference. <laughs>